Hi everybody, my name is David Gully. I'm at Bentley University and this is the second of two videos on R star. The first video looked at what R star is, how it's determined, and why it's fallen. This video is going to be concerned with why it's important that R star has fallen. And please note, we have a whole series of videos on our YouTube channel concerning monetary policy uh, topics, so please visit that channel if you've got a chance. All right, so in our first video, so we discuss what R star is, how it's determined, and why it's fallen. So R star is also sometimes called the natural rate of interest, and by Lansing's definition from 2017, is the inflation-adjusted short-term interest rate that is consistent with full use of economic resources and steady inflation near the Fed's target level. In other words, it's when the economy is operating at full employment at an inflation rate of around 2%. What's the real interest rate that is observed at that? That's R star. Now, R star is determined by a whole host of long-term factors, and these factors in recent years, on net, have worked to reduce R star, not just in the U.S., but in most advanced countries around the world. So some examples, we have reductions in population growth, we have slow total factor productivity growth, slower aggregate economic growth, and relatively high saving levels. So on net, these are working to push down R star. So the point here is to look at, well, why does it matter that R star has fallen? So let's think of this question. Most central banks in the world use a short-term interest rate as their main policy instrument. So for a particular economic situation, what's the right rate for the central bank to set? And so what we can do is we can use two workhorse um, frameworks, the aggregate demand aggregate supply model and the Taylor rule, to help us understand this situation. And just as an aside here, we have a, a, what I think is a very helpful video on the Taylor rule uh, elsewhere on our YouTube channel. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at three particular scenarios. Now we could look at other scenarios, but these three will get the job done. So the first scenario is let's imagine that both inflation and GDP growth are below the Fed or any central bank's target. So we're going to cleverly call this scenario A. Then scenario B is going to be suppose that both inflation and GDP growth are right on the Fed's target. And then our final scenario, scenario C, will be inflation and GDP are both higher than what the Fed or any central bank happens to want. And so the question we want to ask is, well, given those three scenarios, what's the right interest rate to set for each, uh, for each scenario? So what we can do is we can visualize these in the aggregate demand aggregate supply model. And so starting off with scenario A, we can imagine that, for example, that maybe inflation is, say, 1%. And GDP is below its maximum sustainable rate, so that would correspond to scenario A. So both economic growth and inflation are below target. Scenario B, again using the Fed's 2% inflation target, would come in at about 2%. And notice we're at equilibrium at the economy's maximum sustainable level of output. Scenario C might be a relatively elevated inflation rate where the economy is kind of overheating and is at least temporarily above the economy's full employment level of output. And so what we want to do now that we have a visualization of these three scenarios is we can use the Taylor rule to think about how the Fed or any central bank might set its short-term policy interest rate. So let's consider conceptually what we might do. So in scenario A, a weak economy with inflation and GDP below target we'd call for a relatively expansionary monetary policy, and this might be measured by a relatively low target rate. Scenario B, everything is firing on all cylinders, and the central bank is hitting its target, so here we might want a relatively neutral rate because our targets are being hit. And then finally, scenario C, the economy is overheating a little bit, and so what we might want is a relatively contractionary setting, or in other words, a relatively high short-term interest rates. And what I want to you know, make clear here before we move on is that central banks, including the Fed, don't actually use the Taylor rule to set their target rates, but it's a very helpful conceptual framework for thinking about the process through which they go about setting their policy rate. So here's the very famous Taylor rule, or at least one uh, version of it. And so over here on the left side, this is the target rate of the short-term interest rate, the federal funds rate in the U.S., and that's comprised of a whole bunch of factors, including R star, the real interest rate, 
you add to that the actual inflation rate, and then you take half of the difference between the actual inflation rate here and the central bank's target rate, and then add to that half the difference between the actual GDP growth rate and the target GDP growth rate, or in other words, the maximum sustainable GDP growth rate for the central bank. And we'll run through an example here in just a second. But the idea is that the target rate is set according to the level of our star, and then to what extent is the central bank hitting or deviating from its inflation target, hitting or deviating from its GDP target. And so let's make up some semi-fake numbers here. And so let's imagine that R star, pi star, and GDP star all happen to be 2%. So R star is this short-term real interest rate, so let's say this is 2%. Let's imagine the central bank's inflation target also is 2%, so we've got lots of twos here. And then suppose the sustainable GDP growth target also happens to be 2%. Now in terms of actual economic outcomes, Suppose you've got inflation of 1% and GDP growth of only a half a percent. So this, remember, of course, corresponds to scenario A. So we plug in 1% right here, 1% right here, and then a half a percent right there. And so notice that since we're deviating from inflation below the Fed's target, this would work to put downward pressure on the target federal funds rate. And the same with the GDP gap. We're below the target rate. That works to put downward pressure on the appropriate uh, federal funds rate. And so if you solve this out, you'd get a federal funds rate of one and three quarters percent. So the idea here is the federal funds rate ought to be set relatively low because both inflation and GDP are below the Fed's target. And the intent here is to work to increase aggregate demand to get the economy back to full employment, or in other words, get it back toward point B. All right. So, in other words, if we're starting at point A, we want to pursue a relatively expansionary policy to push the economy up toward point B. Likewise, if we happen to be at point C, the economy is overheating a little bit, GDP growth or aggregate demand of the economy is too high, inflation is too high, you'd want to pursue a relatively contractionary policy, or in other words, a relatively higher federal funds rate, to push the economy back toward a sustainable level. And again, the sustainable level is given here by, by scenario B. Well, okay, so what's the problem here? Again, so let's go back to our scenario A. Federal, the, the economy's relatively weak, we've got inflation below target, we've got GDP growth below target. Here's the key thing to remember. In any situation, the starting point or the reference point of the right federal funds rate is the value of R star. Okay? Well, suppose though, instead of the R star of 2% that I had in the previous example, what happens if R star happens to be now, instead of the 2%, 0%. Consider the results that we talked about in the first video of Rachel and Summers. They estimated that GD, or excuse me, that R star fell or has fallen to about more or less 0%, give or take. But suppose that even though it's actually 0%, what if the Fed thinks it's, say, 2%, like in my previous example? The problem here is what the central bank will do, what the Fed will do, is they'll set the federal funds rate at a too high of a level for economic conditions. In other words, they'll pursue a policy, the risk is, they'll pursue a policy that's more contractionary than it ought to be. We can take a slightly different angle on this. And so let's suppose that using my previous, uh, previous value here, that R star is 2%. So what we can get from this, then, is we can get what's called the neutral federal funds rate. And this neutral federal funds rate, it turns out, would be 4%. So how do we calculate this 4%? Well, we would take the 2% R star. We'd add it to the actual inflation rate of 2%, right here. And here's the cool thing. 
is if we're at scenario B, in other words, we're at full employment on the long run aggregate supply curve, and we're doing so at an inflation target that is, or inflation value that's at the target, this term and this term disappear. Because, for example, 2% minus 2%, of course, that's going to be zero. So those two terms cancel out. So we have this neutral federal funds rate of 4%. So now let's imagine that there is a decline in aggregate demand. The aggregate demand curve, in other words, shifts to the left. And it pushes the economy down toward scenario A, or point A. So what could happen here is a central bank, if it needed to, it could lower the federal funds rate to about 0%. Or another way, another way to say this is that it has what's called four percentage points of policy room. So it can lower the federal funds rate from 4% if it needs to, all the way down to zero in order to try to move the economy from something like point A back to something like point B, in other words, to full employment. But now let's suppose, though, that instead of 2%, our star is, as Rachel and Summers suggest and others suggest, it's around zero. Well, if we have R star of zero added to an inflation rate of 2%, so remember, we're assuming the central bank is on target, now the federal funds rate, the neutral federal funds rate, is only 2%. And so the critical thing here is if R star is relatively low, the standard prescription of lowering short-term interest rates has a lot of limitations because instead of having four percentage points of policy room, now the central bank only has two percentage points of policy room. So in other words, it's going to be less helpful in a recession. And what's really important to point out here is that this lack of policy room during the Great uh, Depression uh, from you know, 2008 onwards is that's why central banks adopted large-scale asset purchases, in other words, QE programs, and also adopted communication, forward guidance, in order to supplement their policy toolkit. And so this is why they needed to do this, given that they had relatively little policy room with low R star values. So let's take a look at the current situation. So from December 2015 to December 2018, the Fed raised its target value of its principal policy rate, the federal funds rate, nine times. Now, in May of 2019, uh, the Fed, according to Jerome Powell, said they're more or less hitting both components of the dual mandate. The idea is they're hitting their inflation target, more or less of 2%, and they think that we're, again, more or less on the long-run aggregate supply curve. In other words, policy rate ought to be fairly neutral in this framework. So, from the Fed's point of view, the real question is, well, when to stop without going too far, or possibly just as bad, stopping too soon? Now, so part of thinking about, well, what's the right federal funds rate here is estimating R star. So what we want to know is, well, okay, how does the Fed's estimate of R star correspond to some of the estimates that we saw in the first video? So remember in the first video, we suggested that R star might be around 0%. Is the Fed's estimate of R star around 0%? Well, we can't be 100% sure, but what we can do is we can use the very famous blue dot plot to give us an idea of what the Fed's rough estimate might be. Now, before we move on to the dot plot, what we want to note here is that the longer run value, this is the federal funds rate that the Fed thinks is the right value when both GDP growth and inflation are on target here. Okay, so now we go to the blue dot plot. And so this is from uh, June of 2019. And the way you interpret this is that each of these blue dots here for 2019, 20, 21, and then the longer run, each of these blue dots represents uh, one of the participants' views, and the participants are the Board of Governors and the various central bank presidents, is they provide their estimates of what the, the federal funds rate should be at the, or will be, at the end of each year, so 2019, 2021, and then in the longer term. So we want to focus on the longer term here, and so if you take the median of this, this turns out to be 2.5%. So there's some people believe it'll be above 2.5, some people will be below 2.5, but the median itself is 2.5. And now remember, that's a nominal interest rate. 
So we take this nominal interest rate of 2.5%. We subtract off 2%. And remember, 2% is the Fed's inflation target. So if they're hitting the inflation target, what they're telling us is that, roughly speaking, is that the Fed is estimating our star to be about a half a percent. Now, this is higher, this is what's crucial here, this is higher than a lot of other estimates. And as of the making of this video, the Fed's current target of the federal funds rate is two and a quarter to two and a half percent. And so what we're suggesting here is that if our star is about zero percent, that the federal funds rate is relatively contractionary. The Fed, though, thinks it's relatively neutral. And the reason the Fed thinks it's relatively neutral is because they are estimating the real the uh, R star at a half a percent, whereas others are estimating it at much lower than that. So the bottom line is this, is the Fed needs to be very careful. They need to be very careful in terms of if the policy is running too contractionary or also too loose. Now, even though this is really pretty important and really very helpful to conceptualize how monetary policy works, is R star is not the only ingredient or the only component that goes into making monetary policy. And also, we can't emphasize enough that R star is estimated, so of course there's margins of error around this. And it's also important to emphasize that there are other dimensions of policy. For example, communications. For example, the, the size of the central bank's balance sheet. Those things also matter as much or possibly even more than the bank's short-term interest rate. So in summary, uh, there have been a whole variety of long-term factors that have worked on net to push down R star in not just the U.S., but in lots of advanced countries. Now, if R star is in fact fallen, it turns out there's lots of policy implications. So one policy implication is that the typical short-term interest rate target that most central banks use, that's going to be lower, other things equal, and in all policy situations than with a relatively higher value of R star. There's also, given lower policy rates, there's also going to be less policy room, meaning instead of moving, for example, from down from, say, 4% to zero, maybe the Fed now will be only able to lower the federal funds rate from 2 or 2.5% 2 down to zero. Given that you've got less policy room with a short-term interest rate, you have more need for other policy tools, such as large-scale asset purchases and communications examples. Also, other things equal, in general, nominal interest rates are going to be lower. And then finally, other things equal, higher asset prices. So in most asset pricing models, well, I take that back, all asset pricing models, future cash flows are discounted back by some interest rate. And the lower the interest rate is, other things equal, the higher the asset values, particularly, for example, equity values, for example, fixed income, bonds values, and even, um, even other uh, asset values as well. And so, again, this is the key thing is other things equal higher asset values. Though that doesn't mean, of course, that asset values will be higher because other factors will, affect, of will, of course, affect the cash flows. Thank you all very much.